Okay, so today I am thrilled to welcome to the podcast Wayne Fletcher. Wayne is a, a personal development coach and a fellow certified clarity coach. And he helps people to live in the present moment more of the time. So the present moment is where high performance happens. It's where wisdom is revealed and where all things are, are amazing are experienced. I just love that, Wayne. That's great. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. So we've been talking about this for quite a long time now. And you're doing a lot of work with the aim of supporting hard to reach men. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, isn't it? So yeah. can you tell us a bit more about what you mean by hard to reach? So men typically, when they're struggling with their mental health, they tend to withdraw because there's a stigma around discussing emotional matters. Mm -hmm. Um, it's seen as a, you know, a, a sense of admitting weakness. And so men tend to shun emotional support, particularly in times of crisis. So it's really hard to connect with them emotionally, hence hard to reach. So that's the whole um, the challenge um, and the objective of, of the work that I do. Uh, and unfortunately, the re that the real hard reality of this is that the suicide rate amongst men is three times that of women. So there's evidence there that men struggle more than women. And in the UK, statistically, if you're a man under the age of 50, the biggest killer more than anything else, more than road traffic accidents, even cancer, is suicide. So when you say it that for a man under 50, the biggest risk to his life is himself. And so when you say it like that, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right at all. Um, and suicide is preventable. Yeah. So it's through the volunteering work that I do with Samaritans, we know that listening can save lives. Um, so as part of that volunteering role, uh, I want to help have those life-saving conversations. But with the coaching work that I do around clarity and bringing clarity, I want to move upstream and have life-saving conversations with people to help realize it doesn't have to be that way. And as you said in the introduction, I think the more people live in the present, the less impact there is around mental health. And that's where performance is. And that's where, you know, reality shows up. And that's where we enjoy, you know, our life most in the present. Yeah, because you can really only be in the present, can't you? <laughs> that's all we have. Enjoy the exactly. most is what's happening now, rather than the things that you... Yeah. You remember it from the past, which are difficult. Exactly. Yeah. Can we unpack this a bit more? This, where do you think it is that men get this notion that it's weak to talk about emotions and to seek support? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a really interesting question, right? Because women, women see a call for help simply as that. It's a call for help. Yeah. And unfortunately, men see it as further evidence of failed masculinity. You know, it's, it's a, an additional inducement of shame for men. Mm -hmm. And that's, as I mentioned before, the withdrawal creeps in. So they're less likely in times of crisis to reach out for help. And it's, I think, from an early age, men are set up wrong. Uh, very naively and innocently, we, we have this thing in our society and culture that creates a belief system that human characteristics are categorized as feminine or masculine. Mm. And I think that's where it starts. And actually, if, I, if you don't mind me giving this quote, uh, Glennon Doyle in her book, Untamed, which was really around girls and women and how they are you know set up and, and brought up in cages but mm -hmm. she also wrote this section on 
um, her experience with men, uh, which I think is, is a great way of illustrating this. So everything that makes a boy human is a real man's dirty secret. And that's it's interesting how that's said. So I'll go back to the quote. All men are caged too. The parts of themselves they must hide to fit in those cages are the slices of their humanity that our culture has labeled feminine. So traits like mercy, tenderness, softness, quietness, kindness, empathy, connection. We tell them don't be these things because these are feminine things to do. Be anything but feminine. The problem is that the parts of themselves that our boys have been banished from are not feminine traits, they're just human traits. There's no such thing as feminine quality because there's no such things as masculinity or femininity. So I think it's, it's, it's like the air we breathe. It's just in everything that we do as a culture um, that creates these different identities. And they're just, they're not truth, truths. They're just belief systems yeah. that have become mandates. And human qualities simply are not gendered. No. And so we, we kind of learn to contain some of these qualities that we believe, you know, are in the category of, of feminine. And I think also related to this, but also related to the way that our society has developed over time, Johan Hari in his book, Lost Connections, uh, captured it well, I think, where he said, we've moved from eating food to junk food mm -hmm. in the same way that as meaningful values to junk values. So we know junk food is distorting our bodies. We have obesity crisis across the world. Yeah. And in the same way, we have these junk values that are distorting our minds. And when he talks about the junk values, he's not just talking about femininity and masculinity, I imagine, but that's a big part of it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think it, it starts there. If you think about movies and marketing of products, it mm. all references the masculinity elements of that, you know, how to yeah. be strong, how to be tough, how to be independent. Yeah. So, you know, marketing everywhere you go, you're, you're exposed to that. Yeah. Um, and so the junk values get promoted in the same way that, you know, long ago we used to eat food that was really supporting our health. Um, and th what we ate was utilizing, you know, the, the strengths of who we are as humans. Yes. But now we've moved to processed food because it's become easier, it's become more productive, there's a whole big uh, marketing system behind that. So now we have obesity crisis. Indeed. And I think it's a similar process that's happening that, you know, the values that we had when we, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years grew up in small communities with a small number of people and supporting each other, the, the values have moved to you know, particularly with online, where you feel as though you're connected to many people, but the sense of loneliness has never been greater. That, I mean, that's another issue as well, isn't it? And maybe yeah. for another podcast, actually. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about emergency workers, because we talked about them in the past. So police officers, firefighters, the military. And I remember you said to me that they're very present when they're in action. Yeah. So, you know, in a fire or, or in a battle, for instance, or breaking up a fight, maybe. But when they're at home and doing the mundane things, like the washing up, they're getting mm. and they're thinking. Yeah, and so, I mean, just can you sort of talk a bit about that? Because I, I find that whole side of things really fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it, it's, you hear this sense of, I'm stressed out, I'm, I get angry, I get irritated, you know, I, I, I behave like an idiot. You know, if I, see all the, if I see the pile of washing that needs to be done, it's, I've, I've, I need to do that, but I don't want to do that. Why hasn't the girlfriend done that? 
does she not value me? Does she not know how much of a hard day I've had? And But if I don't do it, we're going to have an argument and it's going to screw up the weekend and we may fall out and I'm not valued. I'm going to be on my own. So all of that happens in that instance. And yet if I talk about how they do they feel stressed when they are turning up to a job that on the surface looks like an immensely stressful situation you know that that's saving people's lives having to give orders and yet they say they don't feel stressed they may have a sense of stress because they're you know that's serving them a purpose because they have to apply themselves so when we talk about that and, and you know what's the difference you know it, that always tends to be quite a, a revelation to them and go, oh, yeah, I, I don't get stressed. Mm -hmm. And most of the time that we talk about that, it's because they're applying themselves in that moment. When they're on a job in an emergent situation, they're relying on their training and skills. So the focus moment to moment doing what they've been trained to do and relying on that sense of experience and wisdom. They're not in their head, in a relationship with what might happen or what could have happened. And yet when they're stood at the front of, the, you know, in the kitchen with this, you know, crazy situation, it, it suddenly spins them into a relationship with thoughts and contaminated thinking. And so that sense of not being present creates this, this feeling of stress and, and frustration and anger. It kind of sounds like they need that extreme stress of, you know, being in, a, in combat or in, in a fire or whatever to get out of that, that thinking. Yeah. Which is paradoxical, isn't it? is and it's so frustrating isn't it because it's an example of they can do it it's always accessible for them and there are certain circumstances that you know force them or encourage them to be present and yet they don't realize that that resource is always available to them mm and it's still them accessing that resource and yet it's so easy to get carried away uh, and to get fooled by something so innate that allows that that contaminated thinking to creep in and then suddenly you're carried away in that movie um, and it's harder to catch yeah and there's that thing about how long are you caught up in your thinking for before you realize it mm. and sometimes it can be weeks can't it oh yeah yeah yeah, Not more. <laughs> yeah. and that's you know it it's the most powerful thing in the world isn't it feelings yeah that sense of you know the story that we get caught up can be the feeling that is is kind of holding us on to that story it's addictive yeah. So you talked about, you know, the, that sense of like, what will happen, what my girlfriend say, what will happen to the weekend? And I was going to ask you, what about the women in all of this? Because, I mean, we do share some of the same thinking about sharing emotions. We're not completely immune to, to that. And, you know, will I be judged and that kind of thing? So what can the women in a man's life do to support him when they notice that something isn't right? Yeah. Absolutely. And just as importantly, what can men do to support the woman well, in his life? I was oh, going to say that, but yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think uh, Alan de Botton described this, and I think it's a great way of, of illustrating what's happening. So he said, the sulker, I think from the north, mm. we use a mood or a strop. Mm -hmm. The sulker may be six foot and holding down adult employment. Deep inside he remains an infant, and right now I need you to be my parent. 
Mm. I need you to correctly guess what is truly ailing me as people did when I was a baby, when my ideas of love were first formed. Engage with and forgive the disappointed and furious inarticulate child within. So I think that's a great way of when men withdraw, that's part of the process that's happening. That, that inner child is feeling vulnerable and feel as though, feels as though he's failing the masculinity and shame. And it's hard for them to explain what's going on. Mm. And so it's almost having this ability to, you know, to help them figure that out. But I think the, the key thing is don't be afraid to talk. It's absolutely the start of the journey of looking after ourselves and each other. And sometimes it's just enough in that moment to get it off the chest. And sometimes it's just what's needed uh, to start a journey uh, to get more help. So don't be frightened of opening a, a conversation to start to talk but don't think you have to be able to solve the problem. Yes. And so I think it's important to listen without judgment and use open questions because that's a good way of not bringing your own ideas or suggestions into the conversation. Yeah. So giving them the absolute attention to listen and understand where they are coming from I think are really key elements of of helping men and also say it back um, it's a great way so reply back and say you know this is what I understand that you're struggling with uh, because it's a great way of showing that you've listened and that you understand them and that's a great way of of creating that trust yeah. to continue opening up which is very much like coaching, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And as we know, that you know, the, the power of listening is, yeah. you know, the one percent. I can't remember who this quote is from. Jamie uses it quite a lot. But a one percent improvement in your listening is a thousand percent improvement in your impact. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I've heard Jamie say that before. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. We know that. Yeah. It's... We see it every day, don't we? Yeah. 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 I was going to ask you about um, activity. And I was going to start with that classic joke about men opening up. When challenged by the wife to speak about his emotions, he says, I do talk about emotions with my mates. For instance, he was saying how upset we were when Arsenal lost to Man U. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> But there's something in this, isn't there? I mean, there's always something, whatever we can't do in one area, there's somewhere else we can do it. And I think we talked before about how you couldn't ask for emotional support, but you could probably ask to borrow a tool or to help with changing it. I don't know if anyone changes their gearbox anymore, but in the old days, I remember helping my dad change a gearbox once. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was a very small car. Um, so yeah, that ability to ask for help in a different area, and to what extent can we can we enable men to sort of realise that if you can do it here, you can do it there, kind of thing? Yeah. And that role of activity, because I think we talked about men in sheds last time we chatted. That's right. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's easy that men have a great circle of friends that they socialise down the pub and around, you know, sports. And that's great. It's good to really have that banter and have those uh, social support networks. But that can be quite ego based. And if it's the only support that you get, then it, it may, you may still find it difficult to open up when you want emotional support. Yeah. Um, and that's where you need connections, good connections that are meaningful. And I think there are, there's a difference between asking for help to fix a gearbox because that's, it's kind of, or asking for tools, 
I think that comes back to the point I was making before. It's it's not about your emotions. It's about a practical element. I, I need is, help to fix this mm. toolbox. Mm. So there's no sense of weakness in that. Um, it, it's normal and practical mm. to get support. And that's why we find that activities are really useful to bring men around. So you need the activities um, that engage men. And that forms the platform or the vehicle from which conversations and relationships can develop from. So you need the activity and the shared interest. Yeah. And that facilitates and fosters good connections around that activity. So it makes making friends more of a natural byproduct of a shared interest, as opposed to we're going to start this group who are going to get together and talk about their emotions. It would scare mm -hmm. the life out of men. So here we have a shared interest and activity. People come around that. And then it's a natural way of forming those friendships and connections from which you can start to engage and open up into, into more uh, conversations around feelings and where they're struggling. And it's, it's creating a sense of fun and that's where activities do that. Um, a healthy sense of that banter can be important to ensure it's not taken too serious. Mm. Um, and it gives that opportunity for that inner child to kind of break the ice and feel comfortable and confident in that environment. And meaningful relationships are fostered over time. It doesn't happen overnight. And while casual conversations can lead to a temporary uplift in mood, they really touch on deeper issues. And so it's important to have meaningful connection such that those deeper issues can be explored and be brought out into a space that people feel safe to explore with. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about bringing the three P's perspective to your work, uh, to the principal's perspective. What do you say has been the most helpful for you work in working with men who are hard to reach? I think the biggest impact is creating that connection. Yeah. And connection is the WD-40 of, of belief change. So if you have that, that, that connection, you create the trust. You create, and if you model that sense of freedom, then you're more likely to open people up. And that sounds quite harsh actually, they're more likely to feel as though they want to open up. When you say modelling that freedom, is there also something in the fact that if they're seeing somebody else, another man doing it, they're going to be more willing to do it themselves? There is that. So even when you show examples of other men opening up, but I think it's more about if, if you are having a conversation with somebody else, if you're caught up in feelings of, oh, I wonder how they're feeling about this, or I wonder what to say, or I wonder how to fix them, what have I got to say to help them? Yeah. Then you're more likely to come across as having those feelings. Yeah. And not create that connection. Yes, yeah, sure. And that's what you meant, isn't it? Is that freedom from having that, that thinking again? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And if your attention is completely focused on them, then they will see that and they will feel that and they will feel as though they can trust that. And so I think that's, you know, understanding that, you know, they have all the resources within them already. And they have the capability. So, you know, there's, there's less to do on your mind. 
there's less to think about. And I think that's the fuel that facilitates that deeper sense of connection. And then as you say, the connection itself is, I think you said the WD-40 of change? Yeah, it's a WD-40 of belief change. Oh, belief change, I would say, yes. I like yeah. that, it's good. Yeah. And once you've got that connection and you've met them where they are, then that's an opportunity, you know, to start taking them on a different journey. Yeah. And, and as, as I know, as a woman or as a human being, that when we hold our emotions in, it affects our health and mm. we start to express them and, and work through them. Our health improves. And so we're not just looking at suicide, are we? We're looking at much higher level of heart disease and diabetes and so forth. So there's a kind of spin-off all the way down the line from that kind of repressed emotion and un in 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 unwillingness to seek help and that fear of seeking help all the way through to not just suicide, but all these other sort of life-threatening illnesses. Yeah, it, yeah, that is such a vicious circle. It is. It really is. Um, you know, the, the World Health Organization has stated that stress is the health epidemic of the 21st century. And the World, health, the World health Organization also states that people with severe mental health conditions die premature, pro, sorry, prematurely. And that's as much as two decades early. That's significant. So I know that's with severe mental health conditions, but it gives you a sense of the, the real impact of stress. And, and so it's not only what we've talked about, which is suicide, it, it's mm. real medical conditions that are resulting in the early death of people. Yeah. And I think stress is unavoidable we we operate on stress that's what we're designed to, yeah. to operate on. so it's not avoidable but cumulative stress is avoidable and that's the the piece that causes the dis-ease so if you're constantly unease or dis-ease that the way that reality is versus what you want it to be that's manifesting itself physically yeah. And it sits there and it's, you know, I'm not a, a medical expert at all, but, you know, we, the obvious link of stress to physical health is, has been previously focused on the lifestyle effects, right? So smoking, drinking, drugs, food. So they result in a, in a poor health lifestyle and likely to reduce your lifespan so i think all of that is well understood and, and well known but it's interesting our research is now showing that feeling constantly stressed could increase your risk of heart and circulatory disease absolutely anyway. yeah um, so researchers from the harvard university suggested stress could be as important a risk factor as smoking for high blood pressure because there's a link to arterial inflammation that that causes. So I, apart from the lifestyle habits that stress can, can encourage, I think there's a, an underlying direct cause of-, of I mean, there's a, there's a very obvious connection, if you think, between that kind of stressed out thinking, if you like, and the activation of your fight flight response and the pulse of physiology that, yeah, it's going to lead to heart disease and stomach ulcers and all sorts of things. Yeah. And I, I do remember there was a, um, I did community coach training. Uh, there was a guy in my, in my cohort who came in, I forget what his blood pressure was when he came in, but it was really, really high and he was medicated. Yeah. But by the end of the course, it had come down to normal levels. And he said, I haven't done anything about it. I'm just more relaxed than I was at the beginning. And that's, I mean, it's obviously one case, but it's, it must be something that would repeat all over the place if people, people were documenting it. Yeah. 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 
It's true. I mean, it, I think there's also, I mean, if we go into the woods, we see, you know, squirrels running for their, for their lives away from the, the dogs and, and, and doing amazing things. And that's okay, you know, that they <coughs> get through the day through that, and that serves them well. You know, but if they were sat there all day in this heightened sense of stress. Yeah, you know, like when's the next they, they, appearance? Yeah, exactly, yes. but they don't. Yeah. They, they don't. They get you know, they're more, they're... exactly. Yeah. They rely on that resource being accessible at the moment they need it. Exactly, yeah. And not sat in the tree worrying about where the next dog is going to come from. <laughs> I have to say, the squirrels in Bedford don't give a damn about any dogs. I've ever noticed. <laughs> Good for them. It's the same with pretty much any prey animal. When you're talking about squirrels or zebras or whatever, and there's even that book. Um, I've forgotten his name now. The guy who wrote it. Why zebras don't get ulcers? Which oh is, yeah. Like, the zebra will just go straight back to grazing and not give a thought to what when the lion may come back come back again. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, so we need to be more dog-like. We need all squirrel-like. Oh, oh, yeah, more squirrel-like. Absolutely, yes. Just kind of go digging up your nuts in the face of death. <laughs> Sorry, that was... And that and that really brings me back to the whole point: is if people <laughs> are present, yes, they're less likely to be in that stress. Absolutely, because they're more focused on what's happening now rather than what yeah. might happen in the future. Exactly. And when you're in a stressful situation, your, your wisdom and experience will yeah. support you in that moment. Absolutely. And more so if you haven't been spending the last few hours feeling stressed and, and yeah. worrying about stuff. Drained and tired. Yeah. 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 So the final thing I was going to ask you about, which I always ask this question with all the people I interview, is what would you say in relation to the COVID situation? And in particular reference to these sorts of men, men who are hard to reach. Yeah, I think um, through the research that Samaritans have done, which I'm aware of uh, through my role, uh, the COVID situation has really impacted people's mental health. Specifically in, in men, uh, the review conducted by the Samaritans said it was 42% of men said that restrictions had had a negative impact on their mental health. Mm -hmm. So people create routines that help them, whether it's through social connection, having routines of going out and meeting people. So having that stopped has removed a mechanism for that. Um, but the, 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 the positive side that came out of this review was also that 40% of men said that talking to others helped with concerns and worries they had during the pandemic. So Absolutely. I think that's the whole... That's fantastic. I, I heard a figure, same figure in America for um, veterans who apparently with PTSD, who had felt better as a result of the, of the lockdown, said they've got a bit of post-traumatic growth going on rather than... Yeah, good. Yeah, so it's interesting, it's the same figure in both countries, 40%. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of a nice positive note to end on, isn't it? That Sounds great. Even the right kind of stimulus, shall we say, you do get that change and that growth. And yeah. from somewhere you even never expected it to come from. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, Wayne. That was fantastic.